In this lecture, we will be examining the Native American groups who populated the region that we're going to call the Ohio Country during the colonial era. The Ohio Country was the name given to the territory roughly west of the Appalachian Mountains and north of the Ohio River prior to the American Revolution. The boundaries of the region known as the Ohio Country were not especially well defined and Europeans at the time had only vague ideas about what the term Ohio Country even meant. In the colonial era, the name referred to territory that incorporated most of present-day Ohio, plus parts of present-day Pennsylvania, Michigan, Indiana, and West Virginia. During the 17th and 18th centuries, both France and England claimed the Ohio Country as their own. By the middle of the 18th century, these nations each sent merchants into the area to trade with local Native Americans. And the commercial conflict between France and England gradually became a serious political conflict that occasionally boiled over into violent military confrontations. The French developed trade alliances with the Huron peoples in regions such as present-day Ontario and Michigan. Huron tribes in turn supplied beaver pelts to the French traders in exchange for goods that they desired. Seeking to profit from the lucrative beaver pelt trade, Dutch and British agents also moved into the New York region and parts of modern-day Ontario and Quebec seeking trade. The Iroquois Confederacy and the Hurons had long been competitors for the beaver pelts in this region, but the introduction of rapidly increasing European demand for beaver pelts distorted these existing markets and caused a great deal of friction between the various groups. The Iroquois are sometimes referred to as the Six Nations uh, due to the alliance of these six peoples in the Confederacy. You might be asking yourself why beaver pelts would uh, trigger large-scale warfare and such vast economic competition. A beaver fur um, matted very easily and made an attractive felt that was highly prized for its use in expensive hats craved by wealthy Europeans. Um, in the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Europeans also used beaver fur to make very fashionable winter coats, and the natural oils of the beaver added a level of waterproofing to the fur. By the 19th century, the demand for beaver pelts in Europe was so great that it nearly caused the extinction of beaver in North America. The Iroquois, as we indicated, moved into the fur trade. This led to violent conflict with people such as the Huron and the Erie. Um, the introduction of European diseases then took a very heavy toll on the Hurons, um, who were also known at the time as the Wendat, W-E-N-D-A-T, um, as they came into contact with diseases such as smallpox quite a few decades after the Iroquois did. Um, the Iroquois then took over the fur trade in the eastern half of the United States, and regions such as Ontario and the Ohio country became something like a private hunting reserve of the Iroquois. They'd been largely depopulated of the people who had lived there for hundreds or perhaps thousands of years. The competition in the fur trade also led to conflict between the Dutch and the British, who, as we mentioned, competed over the fur trade with the Iroquois. As a result, the Iroquois uh, Confederacy dominated the Ohio country region by 1680, and Iroquois allied groups uh, begin to occupy or make use of much of central and eastern Ohio country. The map on this slide depicts the major migrations of Native American groups as a result of the Iroquois disruptions in the period of the Beaver Wars from approximately 1640 to 1670. The Great Lakes, to help you get bearing, are on the left-hand side, left uh, lower corner of this map. You can see the great disruptions these wars caused many of the people who lived in Ontario, Michigan, and the Ohio country. The Covenant Chain was a series of alliances and treaties between the Iroquois Confederacy, the British, and a few other regional Native American groups. The various treaties were signed between 1676 and 1692. There was some um, dispute as to the exact nature of the relationship between the British and the Iroquois as a result of these uh, treaties. The British believed this treaty made the Iroquois something of a subordinate people, but the Iroquois disagreed. Um, in the negotiations to a 1692 treaty, Iroquois leaders asserted the following statement. You say that you are 
our father and that I am your son. We will not be like father and son, but like brothers. So the Iroquois asserting that they were equals with the British. The Iroquois believed um, as a result of this treaty, the British owed them, their brothers, uh, military protection for the French. The British, however, believed this was not a binding military treaty, but more like a mutual aid treaty or a friendship agreement. Um, the British, of course, had a legal system in which contracts could be drawn up and modified or even canceled with the use of lawyers and courts. The Iroquois, though, believed that a contract once negotiated was binding forever, that you couldn't go back and sort of um, renegotiate the terms. Um, these cultural misunderstandings uh, led to later issues of mistrust and accusations of treaty violations on both sides. The image on this slide is the treaty that brought an official end to the so-called Beaver Wars. This is a document that has become known as the Great Peace of Montreal. Um, it was uh, mediated by the French. Um, however, the French, we should note again, had a great deal of commercial and financial um, matters at stake, so it's understandable that they would like peace so they could uh, profit from the beaver trade and other trade goods. Um, the drawings on the treaty are pictographic signatures of chiefs who represented various uh, Native American groups at the time. This image is a close-up of some of the pictographs used as signatures. Below the images are French captions indicating the tribe that each signatory represented. The Great Peace of Montreal brought an end to the major hostilities for a few decades, and the French established much stronger relations with many Native American peoples in the Ohio country than the British were able to do. We will examine the nature of French trade relationships in the Ohio country a little later in this course. The demographics of the Ohio country, as depicted in uh, this map of 18th century Ohio country, were markedly different from the centuries prior to contact with Europeans. New groups appeared, some older groups merged with some of the newcomers, and in a few cases, new ethnic identities formed. This map shows the relative location of most of the major Native American groups in the Ohio country in the 18th century after the chaos of the Beaver Wars had settled. It doesn't include every group, um, and there were some groups that may be lost to history in terms of their representation in this map. In addition to the problem of the limited number of written records that have survived from the time, another problem in identifying locations of native groups involves the issue of self-description, or what we sometimes call identity politics. At different times, groups might identify in different ways as it suited them. Also, since there was uh, such geographical disruption, as we indicated, among the various ethnic groups, some new groups formed that were amalgamations of smaller tribes and groups of other Native American groups. So it uh, can be a bit confusing at time, but here are some of the major groups and where they're located, and we'll kind of go through these one by one. The Shawnee were an Algonquian-speaking people. Uh, the Shawnee, however, differed from many other Algonquian peoples by permitting um, the women of the tribes to participate in council deliberations, so they had something of a political presence. The Shawnee may be descendants of Fort Ancient culture, though some archaeologists dispute this. Um, they appear to have moved into the Ohio country after um, conflicts with the Iroquois. Um, after the Beaver Wars, the Iroquois claimed the Ohio country as sort of, again, as their own sort of hunting preserve. They regarded the Shawnee and the Delaware, who we'll get to in a moment, as uh, dependent tribes, which uh, did not sit well with the Shawnee and Delaware, as we will see in this course. Um, many of them were in um, Pennsylvania for a long period of time, uh, but the death of William Penn uh, meant an end to peaceful relations between the Shawnee and English in Pennsylvania, and the uh, Pennsylvania colonial officials granted the Iroquois dominance over the Shawnee, which of course is uh, you know, meddling sort of in Native American affairs. In the 1750s, the Shawnee began migrating to the area near the Scioto River, which begins in uh, kind of west central Ohio, goes through present day Columbus, and then empties into the Ohio River about 100 miles or so east of present day Cincinnati. Uh, pictured on this slide is Hokalesqua, um, who was known to the British as Cornstalk. He was an important Shawnee leader in the decades prior to the American Revolution. We'll have more to say about him later in the course. The Delaware called themselves the Lenape, which means, simply put, the people. 
They were an Algonquian speaking people. Um, they too were treated poorly by the ears of William Penn. Um, in this uh, kind of crazy land scheme um, that the U.S. federal judges acknowledged in 2004 and then an appeal in 2006 um, was likely fraudulent. Uh, the Delaware were forced off their ancestral lands in a uh, 1737 event known as the Walking Purchase. Walking referring to the amount of um, territory a person could walk across in one day. And in this particular case, um, the individual who was a descendant of William Penn supposedly walked uh, 70 or 80 miles in one day. Um, in this, um, this fraudulent scheme, the uh, Delaware lost an area that's about the size of present-day Rhode Island, very significant, um, uh, tens of thousands of square miles. They were forced further westward after the Treaty of Easton in 1758, which was a treaty that saw many Native American groups pledge an alliance with the British. Um, unfortunately, they played uh, both sides against each other in the French and Indian War, the Delaware did. Uh, this cost them dearly after the war in the settlement treaties. The, De the Delaware then migrated to eastern and southern Ohio as a result of the uh, Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War, which again we'll get to later in the course. Uh, the Wyandotte were originally Iroquoian speakers, and uh, they are sometimes grouped together and called the Huron people. However, by the 16th century, their language, which was known as Wendat, was mutually unintelligible with Iroquois languages and dialects. Uh, they found themselves often at war with the Iroquois, as we saw in the period regarding the Beaver Wars. By the 18th century, the modern Wyandotte people formed from this, these Wendat groups of Huron and Petun people, P-E-T-U-N. The word Petun is a French word. It means something like tobacco people, and it referred to the fact that the Petun um, grew tobacco as a, uh, as a crop. Uh, by 1750, these new Wyandot were centered along the Muskingum River in eastern Ohio. They extended into uh, northern Ohio and parts of uh, southern Michigan. There was a significant uh, Wyandot band um, near Sandusky, present-day uh, Cedar Point area. Nicholas Orotoni is probably the most uh, well-known of the Wyandot leaders. Um, he led an anti-French campaign in the middle of the 18th century and We'll get to him a little bit later in the course as well. The Miami were an Algonquian-speaking people who migrated south from Wisconsin between the mid-17th century and the mid-18th century as a result of the Beaver Wars. So they were not in direct conflict with the Iroquois, but they were sort of pushed south and into the Ohio country from, uh, from Wisconsin because other groups moved into their area. So again, this is sort of a chain reaction, groups being displaced, dispersed, resettled, and other groups being pushed out of the lands they lived in. Um, they ended up settling in uh, present-day western Ohio, eastern Indiana, and southwestern Michigan. Uh, the, the Miami were among the most antagonistic to white encroachments on Native American land in the Ohio country. Uh, they were also one of the most numerous Ohio peoples. Pictured here is Miami um, leader Little Turtle, who we will discuss later in the course when we get to the Northwest Indian Wars. The Potawatomi um, were another group of uh, Algonquian speakers. Um, the word Potawatomi means something like keepers of the fire. They refer to themselves as the Nishnebek, the original people. Um, they were allied with the Ojibwe and the Ottawa. The Ojibwe are sometimes referred to uh, by English speakers as Chippewa, but it's uh, Ojibwe. Um, they were in an alliance known as the Council of Three Fires, these three groups, each metaphorical fire representing one of the three peoples. So keepers of the fire would then be, you know, uh, a, a mainstay of this alliance. They were originally based in southwestern Michigan. Uh, they, too, were dispersed during the Beaver Wars. The principal regions they inhabited in the 18th century were in western and northwestern Ohio, southeastern Michigan, uh, and the areas around present-day Chicago and Green Bay. Pictured here is Metea, one of the principal Potawatomi leaders of the early 19th century. Finally, the Mingo were an Iroquoian-speaking people. They were a group made up of uh, a variety of peoples who migrated west to the Ohio country in the mid-18th century. Um, I, I don't like the term, but sometimes they're referred to as an amalgamated people or a, um, 
a mix of people, originally from uh, Iroquoian groups such as the Senecas and the Cayugas. Um, the word Mingo is actually um, um, an Algonquian word referring to these people. They would not refer to themselves as the Mingo. Um, in the 18th century, the Mingo began to resent the dominance and demands of the Iroquois. So even though they are an Iroquois allied people made up of kind of remnants of groups from the original Six Nations, they began to chart a course independent from the Iroquois, sometimes resulting in violent clashes with members of the Six Nations. Pictured here is a uh, noted Mingo leader, uh, Logan the Orator, and we will dis be discussing uh, Logan later in the course as well. And this draws to a close our brief look at the um, historical Native American groups of the Ohio country.